So my partner in crime is just starting up the presentation again, and we're ready to go. In the next approximately 60 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about our story, how we implemented SUSE cloud application platform in a bigger project. It's a project is, which is running for approximately one year or even a bit more, and we already have quite a bit of um, early adopter um, experience that we'd like to share with you. My name is Nicholas. I am the CEO and CTO of Switzerland-based Adfinisci Group. And I have a partner in crime over here. Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a developer at Adfinisci Group and I'm an open source developer by night. And together we're going to share what we learned within the last couple of months. Let me just briefly introduce you to Adfinisci Group. Um, as I said, we're based in Switzerland. We were founded in 2000, which is approximately two decades already. We have four branch offices around Switzerland. We're a team of approximately 55 employees. And our main focus is doing things with open source technologies. That's part of our DNA. We're mainly <clears throat> working in four key areas. One is engineering, where we build awesome things with open source technologies for our customers. So customers usually approach us with a uh, specific need that they want to uh, implement with open source technologies. This could be a database um, cluster which should be highly available or a cloud infrastructure or a container platform. After <clears throat> the engineering part, we usually also end up in a managed service um, contract where we help the customer to actually run the platform in a 24-7 manner. So we help customers to bring uh, in the enterprise um, approach to also have the stuff high available and if something breaks down, we will run during the night and fix it so uh, business can continue. On the other hand, we also have a dedicated team of software developers working on open source technologies, improve code, and build things for customers as well. And bring this operation experience and this developer experience together also gives us the skills to introduce DevOps mentality at customer sites. <clears throat> but first of all, let's talk a bit about Switzerland. Yes, Switzerland. Um, this slide is mainly to tell all of you that Switzerland is not Sweden. We're the small red country. The one next to it is Sweden. Um, this is actually something from the Swedish propaganda ministerium, or how <laughs> they're called, where they're addressing exactly this problem. We've gotten pretty used to it, hence this slide. Switzerland has some stereotypical Swiss things. Heidi is one of them. We also do cheese, chocolate, Swiss army knives, and, uh, well, watches. This one is actually a clock tower in Switzerland, in Bern, where I live. Um, there's other things that are Swiss, Swiss that aren't as stereotypical. For one, this is um, OS4. It's an early free-flying quadcopter that helped start the current drone craze. It was done at our Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and it helped kickstart the current drone craze in being an autonomous flight and flight planning thing. Another thing from Switzerland is Visual Studio Code. We probably all have heard of it. It's the most popular developer environment. It's built in Zurich by Eric Gamma and his team at Microsoft. And it's basically open source made in Switzerland. One thing that isn't Swiss is dedicated regions in public clouds. Some regions are coming to Switzerland right now, but there still isn't a dedicated tailor-made solution for Swiss government customers. Like in the US, you have the government region. Lots of other companies have been getting their own government regions to make it possible that they can run things in their country. Um, there are governance, compliance, and data protection regulatories that mandate building something for our Swiss government customers that actually resides in Switzerland. So we took this as an opp opportunity to build out such infrastructure together with SUSE. Good, so as you know, now know 
who Atfinis Sci Group is and that we're from Switzerland, we should actually start to talk about uh, our main topic. And as you probably already know, Zuse is pretty good in making remixes of popular songs. And we thought that CAP or Cloud Application Platform also needs a theme song. And we have a pretty good idea about the theme song. Let's check this out. Oh, hello Lars. <laughs> So let me get back to that. Um, we think that we need a theme song for CAP as well. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to our pretty cool idea we think we should have. The let's talk about CAP, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good thing and the bad thing. Let's talk about CAP song. And um, I hope that uh, Lars, who just joined them, will bring that in into the SUSE planning office so we have that song next year. But uh, nevertheless, um, Let's, let's get a bit more into detail. So um, first of all, I would like to give you some technical insights. Don't um, want to make this too big, but um, first of all, you really need to know about um, <clears throat> basic concepts inside of, of cloud application platform. So first of all, we have Docker, which uh, brought containers to the masses. And um, I think you, you already heard about Docker. And um, Docker was actually one way to bring <clears throat> um, a technology stack into a self-containing environment where you can just deploy it to a, 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 a platform and run your code inside of the container. But that's not enough to run a bigger workload. In order to, to make that happen, you also need um, a container orchestration solution. And in this field, Kubernetes became really, really popular in the last one or two years. Um, <clears throat> on a pretty um, different ship, there was the Cloud Foundry stack, which was involving even before Docker and um, Kubernetes became popular. And the really cool thing about Cloud Application Platform is that SUSE is bringing those concepts all together in one cool stack. So Cloud Application Platform, in essence, is, is, is the combination of containers, an orchestration platform, and the Kubernetes, uh, the Cloud Foundry um, stack. We'll get into that um, pretty, pretty much into details as well. So, <clears throat> Let's, let's explain a little bit more about this. So um, if we compare a, a virtual machine-based workload to a container-based workload, we'll see that there is some, some huge um, difference in between. On the left side, you can see uh, a drawing of what a virtual machine-based workload looks like. Um, we have uh, the bare metal um, on the lowest uh, layer, then the host operating system and the hypervisor on top. And then again, you have a, a complete guest operating system which contains the binaries and libraries to run an application. Um, on the other hand, containers is, is much simpler. You still have the bare metal and the host operating system, and then on top of that you have the container engine, which already makes it possible to um, build a container with binaries and libraries which uh, make, make off uh, an application. As you can see, this is has a much smaller footprint in the end. Um, if you want to run many different containers on, 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 on more than just one node, you, you will end up with um, an architecture which looks like this, more or less. You have hardware nodes or virtual machines, and they contain pods, which is more or less a group of containers. And Kubernetes actually helps you to manage those nodes and containers in this infrastructure. So you have a master node, which is capable of shifting around containers on, on the nodes. This is the basic concepts that, that you need to understand if, if you're talking about container application platform. Um, CAP on top will combine a lot of those things. So if you have um, a developer team who produces code, you can use the Cloud Foundry specific details like CF push to bring that code into a pipeline and then containers drop off. Um, which contain the running application. So this picture more or less <coughs> combines all those technologies that we just discussed about. Um, <coughs> you may wonder why is, is this all so cool? Why, why is it better than, than other solutions? And I think first of all we have this, this, this simple conclusion and which is already a spoiler. SUSE Cloud Application Platform is actually probably the simplest way to get a Cloud Foundry distribution up and running. Um, let me explain that a little bit. So, first of all, 
if you want to build a cloud application platform, um, you don't need massive amounts of resources. Um, compared compare the, the numbers um, that you get from the pivotal PSF sizer, um, if you want to build a small Cloud Foundry environment, you need quite a bit of resources already. Compared to that, uh, a small cloud application platform with the SUSE stack is, is pretty small. You can even go smaller, but um, this is a reasonable sized um, platform uh, we, we're using for trainings, for example. Furthermore, it's a pretty portable platform. So cloud application platform um, supports multiple Kubernetes stacks. SUSE gives you the possibility to, to run cloud application platform on their own Kubernetes stack, the CASP platform. Also, the Kubernetes stack from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. You are able to get fully supported platform on all those stacks. This is not possible with other vendors right now. And then, one other pretty interesting fact is that the cloud application platform is really, really developer-centric. It offers you uh, an easy way to, to get code into production by using CF Push, for example. You don't need to mess around with, diff with, with many different tools. There's a sensible amount of configuration settings. Developers um, don't need to, to mess around with many different settings. And the Open Service Broker IPA, which was part of the Cloud Foundry stack since a long time, is also an important piece of that, of that um, developer-centric approach. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that if one focuses on developer agility, Cloud Foundry itself is the answer. And SUSE Cloud Application Platform is a very, very neat implementation of this stack. So let's drill down a little bit into the project that we, we, we worked on in the last couple of months. Uh, when we first approached, um, or when the customer first approached us, it became clear that he wants to build a platform which lets developers do their magic. It should be a platform where developers can build their third party, uh, their tailor-made application without um, knowing too much about the, the, the piece and the, the bits and bytes below the, the actual um, platform. So it should be easy and it should make time to market pretty, pretty fast. Um, in order to be able to, to get code up and running in production very, very fast, it's, it was necessary to connect existing service catalog functionality to that container platform. So a developer is able to actually choose from existing services that he or she needs into the application which is going to be built. A bit more of details. Um, Lucas already mentioned that um, it was a project done for a Swiss government office. And a lot of Swiss organizations still tend to, to actually want to be able to have their data on-prem. This probably has something to do with our legacy, um, where banking was really, really important. And inside of the banking topic, data privacy is really, really, really crucial. So I think in Switzerland, um, we, we miss this, this government um, cloud um, platforms. And we have this this uh, mantra of having your data um, in, in your own data centers. Um, based on that, um, we were able to actually build something that fits this, this requirement list with SUSE application, container application platform. The goals are pretty simple. Build a pass platform for the Swiss federal offices. Integrate the existing service catalog into this platform and have a cloud-like billing. So if some th something is um, provisioned, um, it should be get billed. And if, so, if the, the container is not used anymore, uh, billing should, should stop. Because of some pretty um, hard security requirements, we also had to physically separate some of the tenants. We'll ex explain that later on. And in the end, the idea was to actually build an awesome platform which make developers and operators happy. There are some lovely details I would like to, to raise. Um, first of all, um, the direct contact to the SUSE product management was really, really helpful. They always supported us, whatever 
problem we had. The open source first, upstream first mantra that Suze is living really helped us. We could contribute back ideas um, or, or improvements to the documentation, for example, whenever we, we had the, uh, the feeling to do so. And with the platform that we built, um, we could lay the foundation for the future of government cloud computing in Switzerland. Um, let's see some more technical details and what we learned um, on our journey. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of use cases. Um, from the business side, Nicholas already talked about some of the goals we had. Um, from a more user-centric um, view, one of the things were that um, our customer wanted to offer their end users a self-service portal to access the services they were providing, and they wanted to do, do so in a way that non-developers could also interact with the platform and use services from them. Non-developers would, for instance, want to order something like a complete WordPress stack to like publish some blog or something. And that's something where they wanted us to build a platform that even a non-technical person could use this. Um, one of the key things that our customer always wanted is that they wanted to automate everything. They had various in-cluster services, and some of these in-cluster services even had to be offered to customers that um, still are running their application stacks on their, I'll call them legacy platforms. Say, for instance, they had large app servers, whatever, already deployed and just wanted to use a service from our government cloud like uh, MongoDB or Cassandra that we are offering. And the idea was that they could use that out of the cloud, but they could still keep the rest of their workload sitting right where it is. Um, and as already mentioned, one of the really key points that we always had to take care of was that everything needed to be somewhat billable so that the end user was able to pay. Being a government audience that are our users, it wasn't like we could just tell them, grab a credit card. They really had to um, be able to pay that, to pay stuff through the regular enterprisey way that they as government customers were used to do so. Um, our um, customer told us, hey, we have these couple of user scopes, and um, to us these were pretty helpful in, in figuring out what different kind of slices that we needed to do, where we needed to abstract things for our various customer, for our customers' various users. First of all, they have this notion of an end user. An end user is someone that sits somewhere in the Swiss government. It doesn't need to be in the, the technological part of the, the government, but it could be somewhere else that just wants to use the platform. People like those don't have escalated privileges, but they would be, pos would be using an HPOO-based self-service portal. Then next they had this notion of internal users, which are pretty similar to external users, but mostly work in the team that, or in the office that also manages the cloud itself. For them, they wanted uh, to really help them automate things, but they also wanted to offer their developers some space on a development platform where, can, where they can just take the platform for a spin, kick the tires and figure out what's great or what, where they have additional needs. Next, we have uh, the team of operators that actually operate the service at the customer's side. These um, uh, mostly have full access to everything. And finally, there's this role of a platform owner that um, actually uh, also has somewhat of a political background in that they own the government cloud strategy and need to talk like with the political parts of the government to figure out how to carry that strategy on forward. Um, those people are responsible for platform and lifecycle management, and they also manage the commercial and financial aspects of the project. To do this, we looked at a couple of solutions. One thing that really um, was an important thing was the Open Service Broker API. All of the services we are building are exposed through an Open Service Broker API so they can get consumed like everywhere else. Um, some high order features um, are exposed through the Cloud Foundry API itself to the end users, so they can just use CF Push, like Nicholas um, 
showed you before. And then there's this HP operations orchestration thing that is really has always been part of how different uh, agencies order their services from, from the central offering. And we're adding our new cloud services into that portal because that portal is already well known and well placed inside of the government so everybody knows where to go. Um, one big challenge, uh, as we've already mentioned, was the whole billing thing. In the end, it turned out that it was much simpler to have the customer be very involved in developing that billing integration because they know their SAP landscape. They knew their HP OO landscape. And the key point was really that it was easier for them to do it because they knew who to talk to and we would have, it would have taken us much longer if we would have had to build up that know-how for ourselves. Um, right now, this is an integration done by the customer. In the future, we plan on standardizing it on CF Abacus, which is the Cloud Foundry native billing integration um, data mart layer, if you will, that should become GA hopefully soon. It's still a Cloud Foundry incubator project. Um, a lot of the lessons we learned were about integrating into an existing environment. The billing thing touches on this, HPOO touches on this. Our existing architecture looked like this. We have a, a compute part over here that's based on HP servers. There's a storage setup that's based on NetApp NFS storage. And at the edge in the network, we have Big I, uh, F5 from Big IP as well as a Cisco LAN. Um, this leads us to, led us to realize that um, deployment on bare metal will, metal will be really important because those HP servers are, aren't like virtualized yet. We're really doing bare metal Kubernetes. And we wanted to reuse as much possible of the existing hardware that was already at the customer site. We also wanted to do software defined everything. In the compute area, um, that was rather easy. Compute is basically a no-brainer if you ignore everything else. Um, the one thing we had is the new breed of speculative execution exploits that really didn't make it as easy as we wanted to. In the end, things like Spectre and Meltdown led to the um, chief security officer of our customer telling us, well, for some things you're deploying on that platform, you'll have to really do a physical separation. Um, we also wanted, due to this actually, we also wanted to in, uh, automate installing the administration nodes of the cluster. Um, if we wouldn't, ha if we hadn't had um, the need to separate things physically, we could have probably gone with one admin node for everything. But due to the fact that the customer was telling us, no, it needs to be completely separate, we were really at the point where we needed to automate everything belonging to a Cosper Cup installation. This automation is also like um, really helpful in getting the time to market that our customer expects. Um, as I said, Cosp wasn't fully automated out of the box. So the Vellum node was usually installed manually. If you add new nodes to the Cosp setup, you usually have to give them a system role this is also normally manually done, um, but this wasn't an option for our customer. It also enables that once we had everything automated, it also enabled us to check the reproducible checkbox. So we can like spin up a complete new platform in a couple of hours time and everything is just the same like we did before. Um, to automate the complete CASP installation, we had to create some AutoYast and cloud init files. These mostly take care of installing Vellum in an automated fashion. All the documentation described, we had just install it like a classical OS and then go on from there. But our customer already had enough infrastructure in place that automating even the installation of admin nodes using AutoYast or cloud init was very feasible. Um, after they install a new cluster, they usually kick off an integrated build pipeline, which was mostly engineered at the customer site with our support. And this sets up everything else, like integration with their billing parts in SAP, but also the whole storage um, stuff that's needed. 
Um, in everything we did with this, we, we really aim at uh, making documentation and code available as possible. For the most part, this has been done through pull requests in upstream. Next up is uh, networking. With networking, we wanted to be able to expose internal services and have them automatically configure the load balancer from F5. Um, this load balancer needed to be integrated, but we also had the requirement that pods or services in the cluster need really strict network isolation because they should not be able to see parts of the cluster that they don't that don't belong to them. Um, in, in Kubernetes right now, there's this container network interface and its default implementation is called Flannel, but Flannel doesn't really offer much network isolation. Nevertheless, Flannel is still the only um, network infrastructure component that uh, really reached GA in Kubernetes. Um, network automation in itself also had lots of pitfalls. The processes and government models needed to be adapted. But we also realized quickly that uh, to automate F5, we would need F5 SDN services, and those weren't cheap at all. And then also some workloads with really specific security demands needed to be even more isolated than, than just being isolated in the container overlay network. They really wanted physical isolation. So from the solution side, um, we did the thing with physical separation, first of all. That's kind of something we also did on compute, so it didn't really matter for us in the network domain. Uh, but we also had the challenge that installing Vellum and lots of parts needed to call out to the internet to download stuff to finalize the installation. When we started, there was no support for outgoing proxies in these installation toolings. And uh, we worked with SUSE to fix that. So now you can Google for using a proxy server with authentication in the deployments guide. And there's actually some really nice documentation that shows you how you can do that without having to go to your network guys and have them let you find a way around their proxy. Um, we're absolutely waiting to switch the container network infrastructure. We're really looking forward to um, something like Cilium if that's the one that we'll all pick. It's on the SUSE roadmap for this. And that will enable us to do much more strict network isolation on, on this cluster and maybe even get rid of some of the redundancy we have with separate hardware stacks right now. In the storage domain, customers wanted to have their own volumes on the, on the cluster. They wanted to provision them automatically. And they also told us, yeah, we have lots of existing infrastructure from NetApp and we know how to manage that, so we'd like to integrate that. Um, all right, NetApp has a Kubernetes storage orchestrator thing called, Net, called Trident. It's open source and it works like a charm, so thanks NetApp. Um, but COSP can't use the Trident snapshot functionality that's built into Trident. That's, this is mostly due to the fact that uh, volume snapshotting is still an alpha feature in Kubernetes. But we figured out that we can just manage that out of band for now. So snapshotting of volumes for backup purposes isn't managed through the Kubernetes API. We just do that out of band. There's some scripting for that. We're going to change that to be in band as soon as Kubernetes supports native volume snapshotting in a sensible way. Um, our takeaway is if you really have NetApp, look at Trident. It's open source. It's nice and it actually works. Um, we didn't do anything with other storage vendors for now, so we can't tell you much about EMC or others. We're pretty sure that SUSE Enterprise Storage is perfectly integrated with CAP because everything else would be a surprise. And I see SUSE <laughs> people going yes. Um, <laughs> next up was the restore strategy we needed. Um, we really wanted to be sure that uh, we have a okay time to recovery and everything. Um, but our focus was mostly on this disaster recovery and business continuity management. We really wanted to try reinstalling 
and restoring state rather than restoring full nodes. And we were um, always stressing that stateful resources like storage and databases should not be in the Kubernetes cluster itself, but rather they should have dedicated um, solutions that, that um, are closer to those workloads. For example, the NetApp storage cluster. Didn't make sense for us to like try to move storage into Kubernetes for now because there were already much things around and those were already very high available. Um, we didn't want to have backups of like internal container images because um, it should be easy to just rebuild those from the continuous integration and deployment platform. We ended up making backups of all the images anyhow since those enabled us to get much faster restore times. Also, some of our, some of our customers' users or our customers' customers um, are building their own container images and pushing them to a container registry provided by our customer. And those needed to be restorable as well because we couldn't force all their users to like have a really clean CI CD setup where it's easy to recover um, container images from the code or rebuild them, I should say. And then some stateful services like MongoDB or Cassandra started happening in the cluster. This was against our original recommendation, but nevertheless, we had to face reality and we had to figure out how that we can manage backing up and restoring those. Um, in the end, we took a multi-pronged approach. First of all, we're using Heptio, Velero to just back up the Kubernetes state. Then on top of that, there's the Cloud Foundry um, platform, which also has some state that needs backupping. There's a Cloud Foundry plugin called Backup that does that for us. We're doing persistent volume snapshots with Trident to get point in time recovery possibilities on the storage volumes. And then we also built some very lightweight tooling around etcd to just have another copy of the whole etcd state taken at a lower level than we would get when we interact directly with the Kubernetes API for backup like Heptio does. Um, and we also added dedicated solutions for in-cluster services like MongoDB and customer. One really important thing was that all of these needed to be understood and managed by the ops people that will be running our platform. Um, about logging, centralized logging was something that we knew from the get-go that was gonna be very, in, very important. Our customer wanted centralized logging to be a first-class citizen. We wanted to build something that has batteries included, so you run your app on our cloud and you get logging for free, it's just included. And our existing customer base also said, yeah, we would like to use Splunk because Splunk is like the log thing we're using right now everywhere. The reality was Splunk has really high operational expenses. There are log shippers for the various parts that we have logs that can ship to Splunk, but those aren't integrated out of the box. And also hopping on board an existing Splunk installation in an enterprise setting isn't easy. Those setups are usually sized for some workload and we were here with much bigger workloads and much more workloads and we couldn't wait three months just to provision some new boxes on their Splunk setup. So we ended up finding our own solutions. Actually, we didn't find our own solutions. We took the COSP COP solutions because Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, the ELK stack, was already supported in all the bits and pieces we used. We were able to ship Kubernetes logs to ELK using Fluent D. The Cloud Foundry logs we were able to ship to ELK by using the Firehose nozzle thing. And in the end, we'll still be able to uh, switch to Splunk if the customer isn't happy with how things run right now. Monitoring was also important. Our main goals were to establish KPI-based monitoring, um, also as a service to the tenants in the cluster. It was important for them to not have a single point of failure in their monitoring infrastructure. And the policy of least privilege when it came down to exposing metrics was also very important for our customer due to security reasons. 
we decided that we want to use best of breed tooling. So in the end, we decided on using Prometheus because that's well integrated in the whole Kubernetes ecosystem and everyone has kind of started uh, supporting it. But Prometheus needed to be monitored itself and there's no easy way to enforce authorization in, Kuben in Prometheus. Also, Prometheus and Gravana, to be really useful for our customers, they need quite some configuration. To aid in that configuration thing, we are deploying uh, lots of dashboard to Grafana. When we spin up a new Prometheus Grafana stack, we already deploy quite a lot of dashboards that just make the thing look great from the start. It's not an empty Grafana where you can start configuring your own dashboards, but we have a set of sensible dashboards that make sense for our customers. Um, we also deploy multiple Prometheus stacks for multi-tenancy. Basically, each tenant gets its own Prometheus and the operator has another Prometheus that ha just has the same values but has them again. Um, this helps um, fulfill the least, least access principle thing because we now have a Prometheus that we can just give to a tenant and everything will be in there and there won't be any risk that he can see stuff that isn't his because that won't be in that Prometheus. And last of all, we deployed an additional Prometheus instance on old school legacy infrastructure that was already available. Its only job is to monitor the operator's Kubernetes in the cluster. So in the case of the main Prometheus we use for primary monitoring purposes, if that goes down, there's a fallback Prometheus that's just monitoring that instance. Security, we've had a couple of security things. Best of breed concepts and tooling were the only options for our customer. They wanted network isolation and automation. In reality, network isolation isn't possible with flannel. So we started uh, splitting off into separate physical machines. Helm, the chart manager, uh, the package manager for Kubernetes, also doesn't make it easy to deploy to a cluster using um, not uh, without elevated rights. And uh, the role-based access control configuration in the cluster was really a lot of work. The role-based access control was actually not hard to solve, but it just took a lot of planning on the customer side and they were really writing or generating very much YAML code to configure the RBAC so it made sense for them. Um, as a solution, we figured out that the NIST here in the United States have an application container security guide, so we didn't invent our own standards. We just grabbed that and used it. Um, we had to adapt lots of cultural and technical conventions to this new dynamic operating model, and that was quite a challenge. And in the end, we, added, we started grouping infrastructure and cluster apps into their protection, into protection groups that um, have very much to do with uh, the security requirements. Um, in that way, we were able to isolate different workloads from each other by really just putting them on a different rack, basically. Um, there's some great things that we were able to use. One of them is that micro OS as the basis for small ephemeral nodes in COSP was really awesome because it ticked so much security boxes that our customer was wanting. We added container vulnerability scanning in the CI CD pipeline to ensure that everything is like scanned and checked for security issues. And we also st started deploying lots of Tiller instances. Tiller is the server side part of this Helm package manager thing. And basically right now, more or less every user group is getting their own Tiller instance. We're gonna fix that with Helm v2. When that comes out, it will be much easier for users to bring their own credentials and have Helm deploy stuff under their own user context. The good thing about the security things was that uh, Cloud Foundry already has quite a robust security model, so we didn't need to do that much there. It was really just set it up, make sure that Kubernetes below cap is, is okay, and the chief security officer was basically happy.
DevOps, well, enabling DevOps is also something we had to put some focus on. Um, for us, DevOps is a key to enabling our automation. A high degree of self-service capabilities, both via this Cloud Foundry API and the Kubernetes API, is really key to us for us to enabling developer teams that want to do DevOps. They don't need to like fill out forms or anything. They can just log on to the self-service portal and click together what they need, basically. Um, a large part of this was a paradigm shift when it comes to adopting existing processes um, into this model. We uh, had to really make it clear that continuous integration and deployment isn't optional. It's really mandatory for most users if they want to be um, highly dynamic and dev devopsy. Um, but still, we're offering three classical environments with classical development integration production names. This really helps um, new customers get on board the platform because they see environments that they kind of know. Most people have been working with such environments for a long time and just having a blue or green environment is really like a new concept that we wouldn't want to hinder the adoption of this. We also um, made a, a reference architecture to help onboarding new developers. This picture of it is actually really simplified. Each of these boxes here in, in the real reference architecture is much more detailed and it really helps new developer teams that want to start using the platform figure out what bits of pieces are available and how everything works together and is hooked up together. Um, like we uh, told you initially, there are different use cases and different user, case, user stories that we're supporting. One of them is that people that really want to have full control over the deployment and don't want any of our opinions, they can just use the Kubernetes API through Helm directly and they can do whatever they want. But other users, maybe people that come from a Spring Boot background, are really happy with just having an opinionated stack where they don't need to care and decide each and every step of the way. So we just give them the possibility to do CF push and Cloud Foundry does its magic. And we're also supporting our customers and their users with lots of uh, DevOps trainings. Um, these are also open source and are on our GitHub this is the link that we put here. Good. So <clears throat> with all those more or less technical details, um, it's time to, to give you an outlook and also say thanks to many people who were involved in the whole project. Um, <clears throat> as we discussed and explained, the, the platform is, is ready now. Um, Customers starting to actually put workloads on it. Um, we had to actually ship around a lot of different issues and, and, and problems that we faced as an early adopter. Um, we have one big task to, to actually implement in the next coming month. It's a federation um, above different or across different and multiple data centers. So right now it's really focused on, on one data center side. But by doing so, uh, the platform will actually become the default pass provider for Swiss government customers. Um, right now, um, the platform is, is already available and in production, and we're seeing a lot of, of efforts um, of bringing more workloads on that platform. And I think it's, it's really important to also note that we, we also look forward to more independent software developers bringing their solutions to this cloud native um, space. So maybe also in the audience, if, if you're uh, an ISV, think about bringing your, your stack to, to container platforms as it is really, really simple to integrate them into um, service catalogs and then reuse them um, within developer uh, projects. Um, we would really like to thank um, to people who supported us, mainly also people from, from the SUSE team. We had Markus Wolf from, from SUSE Switzerland, who was a big help. Um, also, Rolf Donnert from, from the system engineering team in, in Germany. Uh, Karsten Duch, also from the SUSE team in Germany. And of course, Jeff Hobbs, uh, who was a really big help 
Um, he's the director of engineering in, in the CAS and the CASP and CAP field. There are other um, people involved um, also from the customer side, um, Marco, uh, Leszek, <coughs> Stefan and, and Simon, um, who were a big help. And uh, without all of those um, awesome people, we would not have managed to bring that um, cloud application platform um, into, in, into production. Thanks, thanks to all of you. Thanks to, to you for listening. And um, um, I, I hope that we, we have some questions now. We, we still have some time. I think we, we're, we're pretty good in there. And we're looking forward um, uh, to, our, to our upcoming journey, journey to make even more awesome things with, with the SUSE Cloud Application Platform. Thanks. <coughs> very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.